Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, welcome to worship this morning at United Church on this busy, warm weekend. Um, we're glad you're here and also glad to have some folks joining us on Zoom as well as those who may be watching the service when it is posted to our website after it's recorded. So it's already been a busy weekend for a number of us here at United Church. Uh, yesterday there was the World Relief Pedal to Resettle event, the bike rally at which our church hosted a rest stop in our parking lot, and some of you were a large part of that. Um, those were cyclists stopping here who had chosen to do the 100-mile ride yesterday. And uh, they started coming in mid-morning and were coming <clears> in as late as uh, almost noon, mm -hmm. depending on how fast they rode or how much of a headwind they had to begin with. But um, we provided them food and drink, and uh, about two dozen of those cyclists stopped through and rested here. And um, of course, all of those, as well as a number of us in this congregation and in our partner congregation, Church of the Good Shepherd in Coverdale, are raising funds for refugee families for world relief, refugee families to be settled in Northern California. And today is Father's Day, and it's also Juneteenth, so we have a lot going on. With um, Pastor Jen beginning her annual leave this weekend, our service is going to be a bit different than it normally is, and our musician Laura Croninger also was unable to be here today, so we're going to rely on our video for quite a few things today, um, not only for the sermon, but also for accompanying hymns and some special music from our sister church, Sister UCC Church, First Plymouth in Lincoln, Nebraska. And uh, most of you are sitting in the right place because the center section doesn't have nearly as much glare on the screen as the two other side sections, so, so good job with that. Um, before we begin, let me walk you through a few things in the bulletin so you know what's coming next in the order that we're doing things this morning. Our first hymn, number 534, is in the United Methodist Hymnal. The other two hymns are in an insert in your bulletin, one on one side and one on the other side of it. And we'll be using video, which will let us sing along with the First Plymouth Congregation for all three hymns. And if you're sitting close enough to the front, you'll actually see the words to the verses on the screen as well. So um, you can ignore the asterisk that's by the middle hymn, uh, If Thou But Trust in God to Guide Thee. We usually stay seated for that hymn, so no need to stand up for that hymn. The sermon today is part one of a three-part sermon series by Pastor Jim Keck of First Plymouth that he began this past March during Lent. So you'll notice in the sermon today and also the next two weeks some Lenten references according to the season that it was when those sermons were preached in Lincoln. And the focus of those sermons is on the writings and actions of Lutheran minister and theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer in the 1930s in 1940s. And uh, what struck me about this sermon series was how relevant it is to today's world and some of the current events. Uh, it's very illuminating, I think, uh, and pertinent to what's going on in the world today. So if you're not able to be here the next two Sundays, you might want to watch those two when they get posted to our uh, website because they're really interesting and full of information that I thought was really, really striking. So, continuing to walk through the bulletin today, the sermon will be on video, and it will be followed immediately by a musical solo. And during this music, we will collect our offerings, so I will invite the ushers to come forward and pass the offering plates while the music is continuing, um, right, immediately following the sermon. And the video will continue without interruption, at which time we can rise and sing the doxology, the words of which are different than we normally use, but we'll be singing along with First Plymouth, uh, as the offering is brought forward by the ushers. And notice that the words in the doxology are different than the ones we usually sing. Um, after that, Holly's going to lead us in a time of sharing of joys and returns, joys and concerns, 
And then we will return to the video for the pastoral prayer by Reverend K.J. Langlace of First Plymouth and then sing our closing hymn along with them. So after all of that, I uh, hope you'll join us um, in for coffee hour in the fellowship hall. So again, welcome. Glad everyone is here. And um, does anybody have anything that delights them this past week or caused you to recognize the presence of God near you or in your life that you want to share? hosting of the bike rally folks. Yeah. It was fun. And we had some interesting people that stopped by. There were all kinds of folks who were really serious writers and others who were just enjoying the day and <laughs> at a leisurely pace. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the mid, mid morning break turned into be lunch for some of those folks. Yeah. That was fine. It was great. Yeah, it's great. 44 miles, one direction. 44 miles, yeah, this is the northernmost part of the route they started down in Santa Rosa and we're headed back south again from here. All right, well, let us begin our worship service. Ah, the ringing of the bell, good idea. Spirit, we will read together responsibly the invitation to worship. Jesus calls us to praise and prayer, to song and silence. Jesus calls us to worship. Jesus calls us to hearing and healing, to service and solidarity. Jesus calls us to love. Jesus calls us to advocacy and action, to protest and provision. Jesus, Jesus calls, calls us to justice. justice. Let us heed the call of Christ. Let us worship together with joy.
May this time that we spend together in your presence nourish our hearts and minds. May it strengthen our relationship with you and renew our commitment to live in this world as your faithful disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. This is our third Sunday of the month, so we'll be collecting pennies from heaven. Um, Jean Craig and I, sometime in the next couple of months, will be um, choosing some things. We'll be taking the money we've collected for the last couple of years and making some decisions on what we would like to purchase through Heifer Project, where we would like our pennies to go. And there are so many more, <laughs> and overwhelmingly more, um, things in Heifer Project that you can purchase or you can contribute to than there used to be. Um, they've they've uh, added a, quite a number of things that help women in undeveloped or developing countries um, establish their own source of income. And I, that's, that's been in the last 15 years or so, and I think that's wonderful. As well as the traditional heifers, uh, chickens, flocks of geese, honeybees, fish, um, trees, all kinds of things. So Jean, Jean and I, in the next couple of months, will be getting together and looking at what we feel our pennies should go to, where they can help best. God, I was thinking about the little drops of rain that add up and fill our rivers and reservoirs and how wonderful that is, each little drop which helps. And these pennies and quarters and dimes and nickels are like little drops of rain that will go out and help fill the reservoirs of um, people's lives. I'm thankful for that.
scripture reading this morning is selected verses from Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulon and Naphtali, to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. From Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your father in heaven causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. May God bless us and increase our understanding of these words. Last weekend, I visited my 86-year-old mother. She has just made that move into assisted living, and that can be a difficult transition. She lives in Sister Bay, Wisconsin, that is on a peninsula that jets out into Lake Michigan, and it is beautiful. And the assisted living is only a block from where she was living before, but that's still a challenging move of just one block. So I would be having meals with her for those few days in her new living place, and one day, though, she wanted to go out to lunch. I said, okay. And it took about 30 minutes to get her in the car and get her strapped up. And then I turned to her and said, where do you want to go to lunch? And she said, I want gas station pizza. <laughs> I said, okay. She said, I want to pick up that pizza, and then I want us to drive down by the lake. It's only three blocks away. And I want to eat that pizza in the car because I'm not going through getting in and out of this thing again. <laughs> so, okay. So I drove to the neighborhood gas station. Sure enough, they brought a little pizza oven in there. I got this large sausage and mushroom pizza. We start driving down to the lake and we pass her neighborhood church. And out in front of that church, there was still the nativity scene. And it looked a little worn because. It's mid-March, right? And, and I said, Mom, your church hasn't taken down the nativity yet. And she said, oh, honey, they haven't gotten around to it yet. And I said, gotten around to it, it's Lent. 
I can't believe the pastor's procrastinating like that. And so I pull the car over, I, I hop out, and I'm taking cell phone shots of it so I can text all my minister buddies around the country, look at this, they haven't taken it down yet. And I get back and I said, Mom, I mean, I just can't even believe this. She said, oh, honey, isn't it sweet any time to see the baby Jesus? <laughs> you see, she's still teaching me. At 86 years old, she's still schooling me because I was getting a little snarky, right? And, and she just said, well, I think a nativity is lovely at any time of the year. Well, we've cleared away all the nativity scenes that we had all around the church, and we have moved into Lent. But we'll remember that it's sweet to think of the baby Jesus at any time of the year. Now that we're in Lent, I will be using Dietrich Bonhoeffer as the key focusing device for our spiritual journey. Now you may or may not know much about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He is this famous Lutheran minister and theologian who resisted the rise of Hitlerism in Germany, and because of his resistance, he was executed. He believed there is a clear choice. You can either be a Christian or you can be a national socialist. But you can't be both. And he died for that belief. Let me give you a little more about his life. He was born in 1906. In Germany, but that's an area we now call Poland. And he was born to be great. I mean, the genes were all lined up. His dad was the most famous psychiatrist in Germany, one of the most renowned scientists in Germany. His brother split atoms with Albert Einstein, one of the top physicists in Germany. His other brother was the top lawyer in Germany. This dude had the genes, okay? And he was born with a high intellect. You could tell right away. He received his PhD at 21 years old, and he knew he wanted to be a Lutheran minister, but you can't get ordained until you're 25 at that time in Germany. So he had, at 21, all his terminal degrees, and he, he had to wait. And so he went to Barcelona and was an assistant pastor there. And then he took a fellowship at Union Theological in New York City. And something happened to him. In those first weeks, he visited a black Baptist church in Harlem. And he was blown away. He had never seen a faith that was so authentic and fully expressive. He was used to the sort of rarefied German metaphysical religion. And he suddenly realized that faith could be real in a community. All year long then, he taught a little Sunday school class at that church because he was so amazed. So we went back to Germany, suddenly feeling like the faith had to be real. You had to live it out. A few years later, his brother-in-law recruited him to become part of the resistance. At one point, Dietrich Bonhoeffer decided that he would become part of the plot to assassinate Hitler. And this was a wrenching decision. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer was never sure if it was the right decision, but he felt he had to act. But you know that conspiracy failed. The Gestapo discovered that he was part of this. A knock came on the door. He was arrested, his sister arrested, the brother-in-law, sent to prison. They spent two years in concentration camps in the final months, and we're now in 1945. The war is almost over, but he's aware that he might not make it. 
By all accounts, in the prison, he was this calm pastoral presence that was there for others. In those last months, he became especially centered and took care of those around him. And then Himmler sent the order to execute him just a couple weeks before the Allies liberated that camp. The eyewitnesses say, as Bonhoeffer stepped up onto the gallows, they hung their fellow Germans, not gassing them. As he stepped up onto the gallows, he said this. This is the end. But it is my beginning. He believed in the life eternal. And he believed that he was making a sacrifice that mattered. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is this stunning example of moral courage. But my friends, even as we lionize a sterling example like this, know that there are people all over the world displaying moral courage this hour. Think of the people of Ukraine. Think of people all over the world facing suffering and, and, and showing courage Think of all the people in this struggle for justice around the world showing moral courage. So even as we lionize an individual, remember with me, it's never just about individuals. I'm beginning today a three-part sermon series on moral courage. To the ancient philosophers, courage was the primary virtue. You had to have courage to display all the other virtues. So it was first. Unless you had courage, you wouldn't actually live up to being just, of being compassionate. You need the courage, then you can be your best self. You see, you have a conscience. And this is an amazing thing. You have a conscience. You innately know what is right. This is amazing. You don't need to be told by someone else what is right because you have a conscience. You have this native goodness. You know the right thing to do. You just know it. But here's the thing. The conscience is very fragile. And it's easily overwhelmed by anxiety and fear. And when we become anxious and scared, we begin to self-protect. And, and we lose moral courage. So the first step in courage is to calm ourselves. To become calm and then steal ourselves. You know the right thing, and you must do it. In 1937, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been, come back to Germany. Hitlerism was rising in full fury. In 1933, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had already gone on the radio to oppose the rise of the Fuhrer. That type of authoritarianism uh, was unchristian. So he was already in the crosshairs of the Nazis. In 1937, he published a masterwork, now a Christian classic, called The Cost of Discipleship. And in this book, he says this, that he is tired and frustrated with Christians who think that beliefs about Jesus are so important. He said, it's not critical what your beliefs about Jesus are, what matters is, will you follow him? Oh, he was so frustrated by the high German church with its wonderful metaphysical elaborations about what a, a good Christian should believe about Jesus. But then now they were failing to follow Jesus. For Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the critical gospel text is Matthew chapter 4. You remember when Simon and Andrew, the two brothers, are casting their nets, 
And then Jesus comes walking by and says to them, follow me. And immediately they drop their nets and follow. For Bonhoeffer, what is critical here is there's no calculation. There's no thinking about or theorizing about the type of theorizing that puts you at once removed from life. No calculation. They drop their nets and follow. There was some intrinsic moral authority, this moral perfection that was a vision in Jesus Christ. They drop the nets and follow. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer that said religion itself can become a diversion with all its beliefs about Jesus, all its calculations, instead of following him. So in this first sermon of the series, let me ask of our own denomination, our own tribe of Christians, the same question he asked. Is there some way that we are staying once removed from Jesus and caught up in our theories? Let me discuss our own tribe. You know, we are the United Church of Christ, the Congregational Church, and remember, we have a proud history. We were the pilgrims on the Mayflower. That's why it's called Mayflower Hall and Pilgrim Hall. And they landed at Plymouth Rock. You remember, that's why it's Plymouth Church. And, and, and you remember that they began the first church in America, and it was based on spiritual democracy. The idea that you don't need authoritarian structures and bishops, that each congregation is its own democracy. And we believe that there was a freedom of the individual con Conscience, that you must come to know God and Christ in your own way, that the church shouldn't impose creeds upon you, because if you're forced to give your assent to a creed, that's not real faith. Rather, you have to discover your sense of God, your sense of Christ, and then in community, share it. We became a congregation, a tribe of Christians that valued the intellect and the life of the mind. We believe that you could take the best insights of science and the moral verdicts of the day, and you could fold that into faith, philosophy, and ethical reflection. You could bring that into your Christian faith. We, we valued the life of mind so much, we found in Harvard and Yale and Dartmouth and Cal Berkeley, and we became this really sensible religion. <laughs> oh, do you not feel it, my brothers and sisters? We're the sensible ones. And there is a decorum to our faith. But is it possible is it possible that now we are most proud of our elaborate and intellectually sustainable beliefs about Jesus? And we have forgotten to encounter Jesus. Is it possible that we have put ourselves at once removed? Oh, my friends, the gospel is all about encounter. All about an encounter with Jesus. And when you encounter the Christ, you have a decision to make. Will you follow or not? Oh, and there it is drama. Do you feel it? You have this decision. And you have a conscience. You know what is right, but the question still becomes, will you follow him? Or will we observe Jesus? Or will we, will we admire Jesus, but not be a follower of Jesus? Dietrich Bonhoeffer never mentioned this. But what I think is key about Matthew 4, it wasn't just one person alone having to make that decision. There were two. And it's wherever two or three gather. It's in community that together we can calm ourselves and steal ourselves to be followers of Jesus. 
to encounter him and choose to follow. My friends, in these days, in these chaotic, tumultuous, morally ambiguous days, you need to follow him. Will you follow? As the music begins, and we'll sing the doxology when the music is near to him.
and concerns, and we respond to joys with thanks be to God, and respond to concerns with Lord, hear our prayer. And before I'd like to start with a couple of concerns that were emailed to me. Um, the first one is from Madeline Ketchum, whose niece Judy, who has multiple sclerosis, fell in the shower and broke her leg. She had surgery on Friday and will be off of her feet for a few weeks. She, Madeline would like prayers for her patients, her rapid recovery, and the people who will care for her. Lord, hear our prayers. And also, um, the sad news that Mickey Lane's husband, Paul, died on Wednesday evening. She doesn't, Mickey doesn't have any immediate needs, um, but she wanted prayers for the whole family. Lord, Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayers. And are there other joys and concerns? Bob. Well, some of us know that um, when Jim and Levon returned from Norway, uh, Jim had picked up a COVID bug somewhere along the way. So they are isolating, and that's why they haven't been with us since they've returned this, earlier this week. So just prayers for their for healing and uh, okay. for them. And if you didn't hear that, um, Jim and Levon got back from their trip, and Jim picked up. <laughs> on his way home, I guess. <laughs> and so they're isolating. Uh, and to add to that, LaVon told me yesterday that she now tests okay. positive. So LaVon has tested positive as well, which makes a lot of sense. So prayers for Jim and LaVon and their recovery, that they won't be too sick and that they won't get too bored in their isolation. <laughs> Lord, 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 hear our prayers. prayers. Are there others? Um, I would like to, oh, Richard. Well, I'll say it. It's a joy to see Andy back again. Yeah. Oh, yes, indeed. Welcome back, Andy. Thank you. It's good to see both you and Jackie here. I would like continued prayers for Ukraine, as Russia is not letting up on them and the bombings and devastation and deaths continue. Lord, 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 Lord hear our prayers. prayers. Are there any other joys or concerns? Just to wish all the fathers in the yes. room happy Father's <laughs> I was Day. Yes, I to do that. Yes, um, happy Father's Day <laughs> to all of those in this room who are fathers or who have Friends or family that they are that they feel like they're a father to, or who um, are thinking about their own fathers today. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks to God. God. Jean. Today's Juneteenth, also. Yes. So I would suggest people look up what that is, but it's celebrated by the African American community, and and uh, we uplift them in um, their journey for, for, you know, peace and righteousness. Um, Jean brings up that it is also Juneteenth today and suggests that if you're not sure what that is about, that you look it up. There is actually an article today in the Press Democrat about that, which gives you some really good information. And to it's a celebration, well, it's um, a celebration of freedom. Freedom. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, thanks be to God for the celebration of Juneteenth. Thanks be to God. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, just say a quick prayer. Um, thank you, God, for listening to our prayers. We pray that Jim and Levon will recover quickly and not be very sick with the unfortunate
unfortunate COVID that they picked up, that Madeline's knees will heal well and quickly and not have too much pain. We pray for Nikki and her Nikki Lane and her family with the loss of Paul. We pray for all the fathers out there. Thank you, God, for listening to our prayers. Amen. Amen. Come together in prayer. Speak, Lord, for we are listening. Speak, Lord. For we need you. Speak, Lord, and hear our hearts. Lord, may we someday be able to say thank you. We are blessed because of the trials and the tribulations we've been through in our own lives. Because it is through those moments you have drawn us closer to you to learn to rely upon you, to learn from you how we are to live. Gracious Lord, we dream of a world free of poverty and oppression, and we yearn for a world free of vengeance and violence, and we pray for your peace. When our hearts ache for the victims of war and oppression, Help us to remember that you healed people by just your touch. And give us the faith in our own ability to comfort others. When we tell ourselves that we have given all that we can to bring peace to this world, help us to remember your sacrifice and give us the miracle of losing a little more of ourselves in serving you and our neighbors. Walk with us, Lord, as we answer your call to be peacemakers. Increase our compassion, our generosity, and our hospitality for the least among us. Give us the moral courage the patience, the serenity, the self-honesty, and the gentleness of spirit that are needed in a world filled with trouble. May we who have been blessed go up and learn to bless others. In your name we pray. Amen.
strung together in the innocent benediction as found in your bulletin. Lord, your light calls us forth to follow and serve you. Throughout the week ahead, may we continue to reflect your light in our lives, in our service, in our words, 